Something I'm always wishing that I could teach better is morphology. As a primary teacher, I remember teaching endings such as D or ED and that they meant the word was in past tense, but I don't remember teaching morphology very often. I thought that was more for intermediate or middle school teachers to teach. Yes. And as a middle school teacher myself, I found that morphology wasn't always integrated into the curriculum. We had vocabulary words from the texts, so I would sometimes see a word that had a root like spect in inspect, and I would tell my students what that means to see, and that it's in other words like spectacles and spectator, but I am sure that I missed a ton of opportunities because I was just pointing out morphemes as they came up and what I knew. Yeah. And we know it's important to teach morphology with a clear structure. Now we know that, right? From grade level to grade level. But it's tough to always know exactly when to teach and how to best teach it. Yeah. So we were super excited when another book launched from Scholastic Science of Reading and Practice series, Big Words for Young Readers, because it answers our questions about teaching multisyllabic words and morphology in K through 5. Yeah, we loved this book so much. We found it so easy to read, just like all the other books in the series. We asked the author, Heidi Ann Mesmer, to be on the podcast to share what she's learned about morphology instruction. Let's jump in. Hi, teacher friends. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two educators who want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. We worked together in Baltimore when the district adopted a new literacy curriculum. We realized there was so much more to learn about how to teach reading and writing. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning with you today. Hi, welcome, Heidi Ann. Hi, so nice to see you all. We're excited to have you back. It's great to be back. All right, we are curious about the title of your book. So the title of your book is Big Words for Young Readers. Why is it called Big Words for Young Readers? Yeah, and I'll I'll add the sub subtitle in there, Teaching Kids in Grades K-5 to Decode and Understand. So it's not just decoding now, it's understanding and decoding words with multiple syllables and more themes. So I use that kind of colloquial term, big words, for two reasons. One of them is just that that is kind of I think what people in school think, and I think that's how little kids feel about words. Um, When they come to a word that is long and hard and it's got multiple parts, it's a big word. Um, And so I just thought this would resonate with teachers because it would really speak exactly to the kinds of things that they're seeing. Um, And the other reason, however, was to create kind of a catch-all term, albeit very colloquial and not scientific at all, to catch the two things that make words big. And those two things are syllables and morphemes. And they're actually not exactly the same thing. They do overlap. um, and, and, And oftentimes, Um, A syllable is a morpheme, but not always. So let me just kind of explain really quickly. So a syllable is a sound unit, right? And our English system is not syllabic in any kind of uh, systematic way. It's not built on syllables. It's built on graphemes and phonemes, and then it's built on morphemes. So a syllable is just a unit of sound. A syllable will have a vowel sound in it. A syllable can be just that vowel sound or a vowel sound with consonants around it. And that vowel sound is, you open your mouth and that vowel sound can be sustained, right? Right. So we like to say that, you know, syllables are the, 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 la- the song of language, if you will. Um, so let me give you a word that is one syllable, but two morphemes, just to kind of illustrate what a morpheme actually is, because a lot of people are using those two terms multisyllabic to mean multimorphemic, and they're not the same. So if I gave you the word like cats, cats, it's only one syllable, right? But it's two morphemes. Yeah, right? So a morpheme is the smallest unit of sound that carries meaning in a word. And some morphemes 
are like just words. They can stand by themselves. They're called free morphemes and others are bound. They can't stand by themselves, but they do carry meaning and attach it. And in the word cats, the S is added onto the end to mean not one, right? So the idea is, and if you know that as a teacher, if you understand that as a teacher, you can start helping kids to distinguish um, the morphemic elements of words as soon as they're in kindergarten. You can say, instead of just saying this has an S on the end, you can say there are two meaningful parts in this word at a very developmentally appropriate um, pl place or way. So that was kind of why I came up with big words, because I wanted to fold in some information about syllables. Syllables are kind of a, a little baby step that you can use. Um, anytime you can find a morpheme in a word, you want to use that. But um, there are words that have more than one syllable, but they're just one meaningful unit, like button, button. There's a, you know, you it's not like you break down button and B-U-T means a round fastener and O-U-N, T-O-N means the two holes in the middle. Nope, nope, it all goes together. Same with elephant. Like elephant doesn't mean like Ella means it's a large gray animal and font means it has a, a trunk. Now, maybe, maybe somewhere deep, deep down in etymology, there's more, there's more there, but I, I don't know that there is. So the point is that sometimes we can teach kids syllables when um, a word has more than one of those syllables and they need some kind of approach to be able to decode it. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. So Heidi and I want to go a little bit deeper because when I saw big, went big words, I was like, oh, it's K for K5. I'm, uh, you know, I'm kind of surprised. It felt developmentally inappropriate for the younger grades to be exploring these big words. Like, can you share a little bit more about that? Right. And I think that is an important kind of thing to, to caveat. And, and when I start talking about this, the first thing I always say is we are not talking about taking a word like sanctimonious and pushing it down into kindergarten, right? We're not talking about pushing down. We're not talking about in, you know, inappropriately force fitting Greek and Latin roots in kindergarten. We're not talking about disrupting what we know to be high quality, systematic and explicit phonics which is almost, you know, it's going to be heavily um, single syllable words because we're trying to teach the, the basic graphemes, right? So I just like to say that over and over again, we're not talking about disrupting basic phonics. It, most phonics will still be single syllable. What I was finding both in my own practice and even writing and also when I talk to teachers is that people were making this division they were saying, okay, in K2, we teach single syllable, single morpheme words. And when we get to three through five, we teach um, multi-morphemic, multi-syllabic words, structural analysis. People call that structural analysis. And that division is absolutely not research-based. And it doesn't even coordinate with the kinds of words kids see in their texts. Like in first grade, over 40% of words can be more than one syllable. So we can't wait until third grade if kids are seeing a lot of multisyllabic and multimorphemic words. Further, there are word parts that you just, that sh you can't get around um, in, in, in first grade texts like ing or ed or er, that those are, those are morphemes, right? Or compound words. And a lot of teachers are teaching these things. But you just didn't see a lot of technique, a lot of information about why you, why you needed to do that. And so um, my perspective is that part of what is really important is that we start to teach kind of concepts, morphemic concepts early on when we can, like that S. OK, that's a meaningful unit. Um, and if you think about it like this, so. When we teach, there, there are two layers of English spelling. There's the grapheme phoneme, right? And then there's the morpheme. When we teach grapheme phonemes, we teach kids, uh, you know, how that system works. So here's an example. Well, here's a consonant by itself. 
Now here's two consonants, but together, this one's a cluster. You're just gonna say both sounds. Now here's another example of two consonants by themselves, but they're only gonna show one sound, shh. So here's SH. When you see SH together, it's a digraph and we label it for kids. We label it to tell them that there are different things in the graphemic system that do different, have different purposes. Similarly, when we teach kids meaningful units, we need to teach them the categories. This is a base element. This is a base word or a bound root. This is a prefix. This is an inflectional suffix. This is a derivational suffix. And those all do different things. The base element carries the main meaning. The prefix is going to be added on to the beginning. It has a specific function. It changes meaning. And it changes meaning in one of three ways. So here I'll give you some examples and you can tell me. Unlock, nonstop, misunderstand. Opposite. Negate, yeah, yeah. It changes, it negates the meaning of the base element. So nonstop, in, you have the word stop, which means to stop, and you put non on the front, and it means the opposite of that, right? Exactly like you said. It negates intensifies, so like hyperthermia, superhuman, makes it more, or it redirects, it changes the direction, preview, review, midway, right? Mm. Which would be so fun for kids, like, I mean, so fun for kids to learn about, right? Right, right. And you need to know, like, it change, It just changes the meaning. It, and you could do cartoons on that and comics on that. You could even, like, do charades. You could do like prefix charades where I'm stopping, I'm nonstop, you know? Um, so, you know, that's the kind of stuff we need to, like inflections. We need to teach kids. How does that work? They just add grammatical information in, in one of about six or seven different ways. Derivational inflections, they do something different. So we don't need to turn kids into linguists and we don't need to become linguists, but we need to know how the system works in the same way that we know, hey, a silent E signals that longer tense sound. Hey, two vowels together are usually not just going to represent the typical lax sound, you know, and, and so that's what I didn't see. And that's part of what, what I got motivated about. I'm wondering, you already did some of this, Heidi Ann, but I'm wondering, I, you know, I'm thinking as a teacher and I want, kind of would want to know. And, and I didn't know this as a teacher. Like, what should I be teaching at the different grade levels? You know, I, I was never really quite sure at my grade level which morphemes, which type, you know, what, what should I even be pointing out to students at this level? Do you have some recommendations and some, maybe some examples for the different grade levels? Yeah, yeah. And you know what I'm thinking? I was just using some two words that I want to make sure everybody understands because there's a distinction out there between two different types of suffixes, if you don't mind, that I think people need to understand. I would love to hear. I was taking notes while you were talking. Yeah. So people just use the word suffix in a very kind of, um, they use it in a kind of like non-specific and general way. And there are actually two different types of suffixes that to do two di different things. Inflectional suffixes are like adding s, pluralizing, or adding s to make third person the verb tense, or adding ed to make past tense, or en to make like bitten, written, which is perfect tense, or turning ing, making a progressive happening now. Those are, those are, those are inflectional suffixes. There's about six to seven categories. They come in really early. Kids have to learn them really often, early, but then they're done, right? It's kind of like, it's a, it's a bounded, it's a closer. But these other kinds of suffixes, we do have developmental knowledge that they, they're, they're harder and they're called derivational suffixes. And these actually do change the part of speech of a word. So when, when you do an inflection, like when you add S to a word, that's an inflection, you have cat and then you add an S, it's still a noun, right? If you, if it's run and then you, you know, you put an S on the end, it's still a verb, runs, right? Run, running, it's still a verb. But derivational suffixes mostly change the part of speech of a word. So like, for example, if you have the adjective happy and then you add ness, you had happy, it was an adjective, now happiness is a noun, right? And then like if you say I-O-N, you take a verb, you add I-O-N, act, I-O-N, 
now it's a noun, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there, there, there are lots of these that, that go back and forth and they're harder and they go way further into high school, college and career. So for example, like take, uh, take the derivational suffix archy, right? Anarchy, monarchy. You're going to hear that in high school. Um, but something like L-Y, you know, you're going to hear in first grade, okay. happily, et cetera. The reason we have derivational suffixes is because they allow us to take a word and I say expand it horizontally so that it can be used in a discipline in lots of different ways. So take the word revolt. You're in history and you're talking about a revolt. But you want to write a sentence that talks about the, the, the noun. So now it becomes a revolution. And then it becomes revolutionary if you want to describe a battle or a war. So these words are used in disciplines. They're even used in educational disciplines so that we can take a concept and it can fit in syntactically lots of different ways. So that's a long... The, the reason I mention that is because derivational suffixes will come later in elementary school. And there's there's research to tell us that. Now, back to your real question. So here's what I did in this book. Okay. So let me just ask you a question too. Okay. So if I said, what's, what's a loose kind of sequence for teaching phonics? Like you've you've got a kid in front of you and you're going to teach him phonics. What would be kind of some words or categories you would use to, to talk about phonics? Like first we would do this and then maybe that. And then this. Okay. What do you like me, Melissa? I have my handy phonics scope and sequence that I keep on my desk. Uh, I I would maybe start with like short vowel sounds. Um, I'm sorry, consonant letter sounds, short vowel sounds, like CVC words, and then move into um, trying to think like maybe later on blends and, you know, then consonant digraphs and then multisyllabic words. Am I hitting any kind of things here? So here's the thing. That's what I, like, I, I hope love. I'm right, Heidi. You're no, so you're, smart. You're totally right. No, no, no. You're totally right. The whole point is, and most most K two teachers um, actually are very conversant in those terms. Those are terms that they just have in their mind. And what I wanted to do with this book was to have those kind of broad categories to in, around big words to also be conversant. So I think that's so helpful, Heidi Ann. Because then teachers can say, like, oh, gosh, I'm teaching this and it aligns with this. And then here's how I see it grow over time. Right. And so there's just a there's a collection of things that you just kind of have to know. And like that was one of them. So with big words, I started K1 and it was like first big words are simply compound words like decodable compounds. If you can read sun and you can read spot, you can read sunspot. If you can read sun and tan, you can read suntan. So um Inflections, inflectional endings like S, E, R, I, and G without any spelling changes. Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask about. Right. So in, in K1, and I'll, I can talk about that in a minute, but there are certain kinds of words that you don't, you don't have to wait. You can right away put an I and G on it because it's going to, it's not going to change. And then contractions would be K1. Mm-hmm. Next, and if you want to. Syllable types. A lot of the, the Common Core has syllable types, and a lot of state standards have syllable types. Even the people who put together syllable types, Louisa Motes and other people, will tell you we don't have a syllabic language. Anytime you can find a morpheme and the kids know it, you always want to go to the meaningful unit. But syllable types are useful, um, especially with words like that button and 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 where there's a one unbound morpheme. That's grade one two. Grade two through four prefixes, and then you start to get into inflectional suffixes with spelling changes. I think second grade is a great time to doubling and drop the i, and drop the y and add i e s, um, and then introducing derivational suffixes there, the more common ones, as well as doing some common prefixes, and then in fourth and fifth grade, starting out with those Greek and Latin roots which are base elements that carry the main meaning in a word, but they can't stand alone most of the time, like cred, right? Incredible, 
credit, credible. Um, so those are a little harder for kids because they're not words that they can immediately zero in on in a word. So you have to kind of explicitly teach them those. But once you do... I remember learning those for SAT prep. Yeah, yeah. Well, and an, an outrageous amount of, of words in English, especially above third grade, have those those elements in them. So they're very useful. But you're only getting started in late elementary school with those things. Um, so it's kind of like you're going to teach inflections, kind of get that done through third grade and then really common prefixes and then some derivational suffixes and some Greek and Latin roots. Um, and there isn't, from my reading of the research, a real strict kind of scope and sequence. Um, you can kind of use a couple sources of information to inform when when you teach what. One, is it going to show up in text? So, And two, is it really frequent? So what I've listed in the book around prefixes and um, derivational suffixes are ones that are going to come up a lot, that are highly applicable, re and un and ion and those kinds of things. Um, there is a little bit of research that tells us derivational suffixes start to come into focus in third, fourth, fifth grade. So truthfully, you can teach Greek and Latin roots in first or second grade. There's nothing, you're not going to hurt anybody. And especially if you're in a discipline, right? Like, so Nell Duke has this wonderful, um, great first date curriculum that she has. And I think she does a water unit in the primary grades. And so she introduces hydro, right? Why not? Right. The kids are going to come across that. Right. So there aren't any hard and fast rules, um, but I kind of lay out this broad set of in sequence for 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 the reason that K2 teachers need to have to know where they're going. Teachers need common language and then there should be vertical alignment from K to five. Yes. It's so helpful to hear so much about the what and to hear you give such specific examples in here. And just like a little plug, your book has so many more examples too. Obviously we're only like an hour, less than an hour podcast. <laughs> a whole lists at the end, which whole I list. teachers love lists. <laughs> I wanted to highlight everything on your list yeah, and I the didn't. Appendix is. Right. Well, and, and that is um, my big hope. There are two things I, I'll just say. Um, this book was edited by a really marvelous editor at Scholastic, and he edited Lin Julia Lindsay. He's edited the whole Science of Reading series. I read Julia Lindsay's book, and I tell people I read it at the pool. Exactly. And I wanted to emulate that in this book because um, teachers need to know what they want and need to know. They don't need extras. And so I imagine a teacher with the graphics. There's tons of graphics. That was the other thing. I... I, about halfway through the book, what I started doing is reversing my writing process where I designed all the graphics first and then I wrote around the graphics so that, and I would hope that people would be tabbing, like if you want to remember, okay, when do I change the Y to I and add ES, there, you can tab it. There's a little graphic for that. Or I need some, some you know, decodable compounds if kids know CVC words. There's the list for that. So I worked really hard to make it. I, I I imagined it being tabbed, being a book you could just pull open. And yeah, I wanted it to be that way. Yeah. Well, I know that so many teachers are going to use it. Um, thinking about not only just what they're teaching, but how they're teaching. And so I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about that, Heidi Ann. What are your tips for effectively teaching morphology? Okay, so a um, couple of couple of things. I'll start with little things that you can do really early on. So um, one of the things that you can do with kids as soon as you're teaching like inflections is you can teach them that what I what I call the morphological principle, and the morphological principle is it's it's like this that. Basically, um, words are spelled consistently across related words, even if they don't sound exactly the same way. So like if you take the inflection ED, it sounds one of three ways, T, ED, or D, right? Mm -hmm. But you can explain to kids that 
Even if you hear the t sound in English, if you're making a word past tense with ed, you always use ed. And what you're doing is illustrating that morphological principle. Um, you can start to teach kids. I have an activity called make it big, which is in that first big words chapter. And you can take, there are certain words that you don't have to do any spelling changes when you add inflections. So for example, you could take a word like cook. So you've taught the OO and you can give kids that base cook, and then you could give them some inflection cooks cooker. Now cooker is not an inflectional suffix there. It's actually a derivational. It means one who. ER is actually um, a word part that can be both an inflectional suffix and a derivational. Oh, that's tricky. And now there's a little box in, in the, in the, in the book about that. You can never say never in English. You can never say always in English. Never. It just doesn't work. Um, then, or, or I and G. So they take that base, they can add the inflections, then you can compound it. So you can make cook top, cook book, or you can go the other way. And I'm trying to think of a word that um, has something cook on the, the front. Anyway, what you can do is without making any spelling changes, you're building kids confidence in making big words. You're showing them that one word that's a base can become lots of other words with with other bound morphemes. That's a, an example. I saw somebody doing a word chain with, with kids around the O-W. They were doing the O sound, grow, etc. And if you are of the mindset that, hey, I could just show kids how there are um, some morphemes in this, you could take that word chain and add S, right? Or add ing really quickly. And in the book, what I essentially do is I identify, like if you take a typical phonic scope and sequence, I say, okay, after you've taught CVC words and the kids can really, really automatically read them, you can do CVC words with S right away. You don't have to wait. Easy add, light add. Um, after you've done words with um, consonant clusters and digraphs, you can take the ed, ing, and er and put those on the end of those words without any spelling changes. Doesn't work with es, right? But you can do it. And so I've just infused these. I have this little chart here. I get much more micro level in the individual chapters where I show you explicitly how to just lightly add in some big words. A um, couple other quick kind of tips. If you are in a K-5 school and you want to think vertically and talk to each other, you could use a technique called seek the parts you know, spy. And this one comes from, I want to make sure I get it right. I think this is the Love It um, series of, of studies. Um, but seek the parts you know is really flexible because it's simply what parts do you see? So if you know a morpheme, you can look for that. If you know prefix, you can look for that. If you don't know a morpheme, but you see a syllable type, you can look for that. And it just trains kids to look at words as if they are parts. And that's part of the problem, right? We're always on this sounded out thing. And, and really, sounded out only works for CVC words, CVCC words, right? It just doesn't work for many, a lot of other words. And so that's another thing. Kind of one of the principles is that um, all of word instruction is build it up, take you know, it's like you build it up, you break it down, you build it up, you break it down. That's kind of what you're doing with kids. So they come to a word like desensitizing. All right. How can we break it up? We see an I and G, we see D. What do we see in the middle here? We see, wow, three vowels. That must be three syllables. Sen. Okay. I've got a close syllable. Sen, sit, I. Okay. And they can break it down. Um, so, I mean, that that's kind of the, the overarching um you know, kind of idea. The other thing I would say is we have a lot of multilingual learners, many of whom are Spanish, um, really taking advantage of cognates um, like información, policia, immigración um, are another really um, exciting way to to kind of bring kids into their Latinate roots of English and and, and amplify um, your your uh, Spanish speaking multilingual learners. Um, so there are lots of different um, techniques that you can use. There are morpheme triangles. You, need, you can take a word root and kind of explode it. What are all the different words you can 
make with spect, spectacle, um, et cetera. Um, so I've got lists in the back, um, list of decodal compounds. I've got word equations and kind of step, how do you go through these things? Um, and you can use chat GPT. A lot of times you can just enter in, you can say, give me, give me 10, um, you know, give me 10 uh, compound words with cat in them. And, and you can, you can have those right there. Never even thought of that. Catnip. I'm your own chat GPT right here. I thought of one. Right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes it comes up with things you're like, mm, not, not really, but yeah, I know. you know, like a good starting color. point. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering about assessment just because I've, I don't think I've heard very much about assessing morphology, although listening to you today, it's like, it seems so important, but do you have any recommendations for assessments for morphology specifically or other, maybe assessments teachers are already giving that could tell them something about what their students know about morphology? Yeah. So I think because, um, you know, because it hasn't been a big part of the K-5 dialogue, we didn't, we haven't seen a whole lot of um, morphological assessments. Um, a lot of what you see are decoding inventories, which assess um, kids' abilities to just pronounce the word, right? Um, and it's important to remember that morphology is not just decoding, but understanding the, the, the meaningful unit in, in the word. So, you know, a decoding inventory doesn't completely get at morphology. Um, there's a wonderful site that um, Goodwin et al. have put out there um, called Monsters, and it's a, a, a website that you can go to. And they have a real, like, it's a cool gamified um, approach to morphology assessment that asks kids to do things like take a root and decide what morphological part of the family would go in a word. So for example, you might take a word like finance and it might say the, the, the word, the sentence might say something like he had excellent blank skills and they have to know that financial is the one that would go there, that, that, that derived adjective um, or kids abilities to take parts off and be able to tell you what they mean. Um, you can use spelling inventories. Spelling inventories also will often capture, can kids make those spelling changes with inflections? Do they know, for example, like, why don't we spell accident A-K-S-U-D-U-N-T, in T, right? Well, you know, it, it, you know, or, or electricity, right? It, there's the, that base word electric. And in English, we spell things visually similar to the word that they're related to, even if there's a shift in the spelling, I mean, in the sound you hear. So like in electric, the C becomes soft in certain words, but you don't use an S, right? And a lot of times those changes you'll see are really around a voiced or unvoiced um, variation of a of, of consonant sound. So like the S at the end of words that can either be the soft sound or the z sound. Um, it actually, it, it pronounce, if you think about it from a pronunciation standpoint, that S at the end is more often going to say the voiced z sound, but we don't spell it that way, right? Um, I'm, I kind of got off guard. Anyway, the decoding inventories, the spelling inventories, and then the real true morphological assessments are things that you can use. I, I would say with the decoding inventories and probably the spelling inventories, I would really love it if there were more um, items, right? You know, a lot of times you don't like, you know, you don't have items for all of the different ones. Right, it's just a sampling. Yeah, it is. Yeah. All right. So let's take a quick step back and think about why morphology should be something teachers prioritize and I specifically am curious about what the research says about teaching morphology and if you can share a little bit of what the research says. Yeah. So um, what we know is that um, there is a relationship between kids' comprehension and their vocabulary knowledge um, as a result of knowing the meaningful parts of words. And so 
that allows them to really um, hang on to uh, the meanings of words and to transfer that. And also to, um, as they're reading and get older, to gather information about what a word might mean based on its morphology. So um, there's there's a number of meta-analyses that tell us that, um, that, that kids really benefit from explicit instruction in that, um, and that depending on the outcome, it's usually vocabulary and comprehension, which would make sense because morphology is really the crossover between decoding and comprehension, right? It's, it's both things. It's wrapped, it's, it's decoding the word, but then knowing how the parts of the word contribute to the meaning above and beyond the base element or the base word or the root. So it, it is both of those things. And that's why kids really need it. And it's the thing that's really important too, is that it is the second layer, if you will, of our English system. Yes, we're an alphabetic system. Yes, there's a relationship between visual symbols and sounds. But the next layer is that those those graphemes build morphemes, build words. And we've kind of just in elementary school gone from grapheme, phoneme, word. (laughs) But there's this other part in there, and that is morpheme. I don't even think a lot of teachers even know what bound morphemes are. I mean, like they intuitively know, right? Like, you know, they know the parts. They might use the word suffix or prefix. But the class of kind of word parts is is morphology. And my one of my big kind of things with this book is that's just language teachers should be comfortable with. And not because they need to impress people or like, you know, I'm not into this. We've got to scientize things for the sake of scientizing them and making them legitimate and rigorous. We just, it's a, it's part of the system, right? In the same way that you need to have some language to talk to kids about categories of graphemes, you need to have that with morphology and morphemes. So I think it's really important that that becomes something that teachers are, are fluent in. So, because then they can, they can take off and do a better job than anybody. So it's, it's, we're, more fun. We're, we've just missed, like, it should be a pillar. Like, it's just like a huge omission. I mean, it, I would not, I don't think morphology is phonics. I don't think that's accurate. It's just this omission that like people are not paying attention to or what weren't. And we need it to be there and we can have it be there in very appropriate ways from the beginning. Well, I'm so glad that you wrote a whole book about it for the entire world. Oh, well, I'm I'm glad this is not a comprehensive book. It's it's a kind of taste. Um, and if you are teaching, you know, in middle school or secondary school, you're going to need a lot more detail there. But I think in, in elementary school, we can make it a lot easier by building a big words mindset, by teaching kids how these categories of, of meaningful units work um, so that when the kid gets to you know, sixth grade, they know how the system works and it's not just left to right sounded out. Yeah. And I think previously, you know, it used to be like kind of an implicit thing, like, oh, well, obviously they'll kind of like, I mean, or here and there you would teach, but not anything systematic, at least for me in my experience, right. Being in the classroom, like it was like, oh, they'll kind of figure out like unlock means like you said, like t- the opposite of locked. Right. So the door's unlocked. It's uh, okay. Um, but I I love the idea of having structure around this really important piece. And I think it's a question that teachers ask a whole lot. I know Melissa and I talk about it a lot. We ask a lot of questions about it. And, you know, you're not our first guest to talk about it, but you're our first guest to really kind of bring this to K-5 so explicitly. So um, we're really grateful to you for that. Thanks. Yeah, and I think we can easily add it into scope and sequence for phonics without disrupting anything. It's very easy add early on, very easy add. And that's a big message too. Because if you can't, if you can't decode, like say you come to the multimorphemic word delightedly, but you don't know IGHT, you're you're not going to decode delightedly if you don't know the base 
graphene, you know, the, the graphemes in the base element. So you have to do that, right? We're not talking about disrupting that, but, um, you know, that's not enough. You have to have more than that. Would you want to leave our listeners with one last thing about uh, big words or teaching multisyllabic or multimorphemic words? Now I'm getting really good at saying that. What I would say is if you're listening to this and you're like morpheme and derivational, what? Yeah, I don't want it. If that's what you're thinking, the book is designed to make those things very understandable and to lean very heavily on graphics, very heavily on graphics. And the editor went through and would tell me, teachers don't need to know that. So if you're a person who, when somebody says morpheme, you go, what is she talking about? Is she talking about the drug? What does she mean? Because it's a weird word, right? This is the book for you. It's a first taste. It is a first taste, and it might make you curious to really, really start going out there and looking at a lot of other really great um, resources. We we just can't let this go. We can't just, it can't be implicit. Absolutely not. So, yeah. And the message I hear too is that we just can't wait. We cannot wait until upper elementary, you know, just till fifth grade and sixth grade and on to be teaching morphemes or, you know, we can't, it's too, not that it's too late. It's just, we're wasting time and opportunity earlier. Right. And and it's kind of like that learning to read, reading to learn fake division. Do you know what I mean? It's the same thing. Um, it all sound, and I admit to being part and party to that kind of division in this area. It all sounded really useful. And then it doesn't make any sense because kids actually have to read words that are multisyllabic and multimorphemic almost immediately. Um, simple ones, but they still have to do it. Well, we are so, so grateful that you took some time to talk with us today and we can't wait for everyone to run out and grab big words. Um, we will, I'll read the full title again for you. It is big words for young readers, teaching kids in grades K to five to decode and understand words with multiple syllables and morphemes. So it's available at the Scholastic Teacher Store on Amazon, your local bookstore, wherever you buy books. Hi, Deanne. You're the best. We love big words. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. To stay connected with us, sign up for our email list at literacypodcast.com. Join our Facebook group and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. If this episode resonated with you, take a moment to share with a teacher friend or leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Just a quick reminder that the views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests of the Melissa and Lori Love Literacy Podcast are not necessarily the opinions of Great Minds PBC or its employees. We appreciate you so much, and we're so glad you're here to learn with us.